Good afternoon, folks. Uh, welcome to Mad, Bad and Dangerous. This afternoon, we are at Kew Gardens, Kew the Music, which features Jules Holland. And we are indeed fortunate to have with us today drummer Gilson Lavis. Hello. Gilson, welcome. Thanks for coming. <laughs> My privilege. 1963, tambourine and your mum's knitting needles. That's right. Yeah. You've done your homework. Yeah, I absolutely. have indeed. Yeah. <laughs> the only reason why I was playing tambourine and knitting needles was because the school band had 12 lead guitarists and no drummer. And the only way I could get in the school band was to be the drummer. And I had no desire to be the drummer. I just wanted some admiration and girls. So it wasn't a... It had nothing to do with a burning <laughs> desire to be a drummer. It just... So you kind of fell into I it fell in, into in, it. in, 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 in <laughs> so, a random sort of fashion. <laughs> yeah. Well, we fast forward a few decades, and as well as being the drummer for Legend Squeeze and Jules Holland, along the way you've played with just about every other legend like Barry White, Smokey Robinson, Dave Edmonds, Boy George, Lisa Stansfield, Alison Moyer, George Harrison, Charlie Watts, Adele, the list goes on and on. Mm. Has that all been in a day's work, or have there been any mad, bad or dangerous bits and bobs floating around? Oh, uh, well, there's been lots of stuff, lots of um, stories, lots of things have gone on. I, I did a TV show with, uh, with Smokey and Eric, was, Eric Clapton was on rhythm guitar. Yeah. And um, uh, and lovely man, I've, I've known him for a long while. And uh, Jules was on piano, drums, and Dave on bass. And it was at, at the BBC, and it was on a, a later show. And we waited for Smokey to turn up, and um, he didn't. <laughs> and we were sitting there and sitting there, and, the, and we did a sort of run through. So we had an idea what was going on, and Smokey will be here any minute. And then the message came through. Smokey's a bit tired, he's, he's gone to bed, so he's, he's just flown in, <laughs> but uh, he'll be here in half an hour, half an hour, hour, two hours, and then the show started, and we're still sitting there with no Smokey, uh, and, uh, and the band that, that was immediately before Smokey was playing, and there was still no Smokey, and then actually 10 seconds before it was his turn, he walks out, and he walks out, and he sparkles, I've never seen anybody that looks more like a star than Smokey Robinson. It was just, whoa, just beautiful skin and teeth and eyes. And his hair glistened and it was, whoa. And he walked out to the front and, and he smiled at Julian. And then he smiled at Eric and he didn't bother smiling at me. And then we started and we played it and it was just oh, breathtaking. And then he turned around and went out. And that was it. And that was it. That so he turns up with 10 seconds to spare. And <laughs> Perfect performance. And yeah. just left. And didn't Smoking. acknowledge... <laughs> left in a puff of smoke. <laughs> yeah. And he didn't acknowledge you at all when he... When oh, he no, well, it, 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 sort of, you know. There wasn't anything deliberate. I mean, no, it's, just in a hurry it's very it hard to acknowledge a whole room and all the musicians in 10 seconds. Yes, exactly. Yeah. So I got my fair dues. You know, I didn't feel... <laughs> <laughs> and the gig was out. all right. So yeah, it was, it, it, was, you know, it, was, it was great. It was a good day out. You know, it was nice. Um, in the early days with Squeeze, where you have a lot of downtime, so you're encouraged to, to go a bit berserk. And I don't think anybody encouraged me. I didn't need any encouragement, really. <laughs> it was just, um, uh, I'm a recovering alcoholic. I mean, right. I haven't drunk for decades now, thankfully, a day at a time. But uh, so a lot of that stuff in... In the first era of Squeeze is, is very, very foggy. It's a bit like a, a yeah. grey swirling mass. Yeah. It's not a, a, a fun existence being a practising alcoholic. Um, it, it gets harder and harder to put on the show. Yeah. And I don't mean just the show on stage. I mean the show on yeah. life, you know, yeah. to present yourself as a reasonable human being because actually slowly day by day you're disappearing as a yeah, human yeah. being, you know. Um, so it got quite tricky near the end. An example would be... Uh, we played, um, uh, we recorded a, a, an album at Rockfield uh, uh, years and years ago when I was, when I was um, uh, practicing my, my drinking. And, um, and we, Julian and myself, Jules and myself, would walk down to a local pub and he'll walk long distances for a pint of beer. He enjoys yeah. it. Um, and so I walked all the way there grumbling about how far <laughs> it was. And then on the way back, of course, I was really pissed. And we get back to the chalets. There are chalets at Rockfield. And, uh, and Julie decides to go to bed because he's a reasonable human being. But I stayed up and got even drunker. And then I decided to make a fry up about two o'clock in the morning when I was really <laughs> pissed. And I made this fry up. And, um, uh, and of course, halfway through cooking it, I passed out. And this fry up then turned into flames. And the flames turned into a smoke filled, which right. finally woke me up. And I came to and saw the flames and Julian 
upstairs still asleep. So I woke Julian up and then I proceeded to put out the fire with Julian's underpants, <laughs> which ended up just a burn sort of mess. And we staggered out into the, um, into the yard. Uh, thankfully, nobody was hurt and the, the place didn't burn down, but it was a close call. Dangerous, that was certainly. the sort of things that happened. <laughs> mad and dangerous. It, it, yeah, mad, bad and pretty dangerous. But so the only real, um, real casualty was Julian's underpants. The underpants, well, the underpants. presumably he wasn't overly fond of those. Well, he wasn't wearing them, right. which is, which <laughs> is the time. another... <laughs> this particular... <laughs> Sorry, I've got so many stories. Yeah. Squeeze were playing at Brighton, uh, and it was in the punk era, and it was in that really charming age where the audience thought it was really groovy to spit and throw, oh, yeah. and throw piss, cups of piss all over the oh, band, wow. and it was just mm. revolting. Uh, and I was, uh, I was about 24 at this age of my career. I've been a professional drummer, as I said, since I was 14. And I'd done a lot of varied work by then. I've been a uh, drummer for uh, Dolly Parton. I've been a drummer for Chuck Berry. I've played with all mm. sorts of people. I've played country festivals and I'd, really, you know. And um, so this was, you know, I was used to moe suits and bow ties. And now I'm in this punk band that are having this, and I was, oh, how dare you? And this particular gig um, was just along the road from a veterinary college. And um, somebody thought it'd be really amusing to bring along some pig's fetuses and throw them at the band. At the band. And they were coming on the stage and oh, sliding down. Yeah. And, uh, and it was really not very pleasant at all. And after, after when we finished the, the set, we were standing in the bar and I was drinking as I always was in those days. And Chris said to me, that's the bloke over there, he's the one who... Threw. And so I jumped on top of the tables and ran across the tables in the bar, yeah. from table to table. The last one actually fell over, so I fell to my knees in front of this chap. <laughs> and I, I stood up and I grabbed him like this. I you fucking cut I'm going to rip your fucking head off what you mean for... <laughs> and his girlfriend was standing there going, easy, it wasn't him, it wasn't him. It wasn't him. Are you sure? Yeah. And the whole, of course, the whole place is looking at this animal, you know. <laughs> so I let go and I walked back and Chris said, I don't think it was him, actually. <laughs> Typical Chris Tiffin. After you know, all that. Absolutely. Yeah. <laughs> what was it like working with, working with Chuck Berry? Oh, it, 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 oh God, stories. Bless him. Uh, I was pretty young. I was only about 18. Yeah. And I was doing, playing with these people, you know. Um, um, a lot of people, Edwin Starr I was working with, and Arthur Connolly, and Chuck yeah. Berry, and Dolly Parton, and Tammy Wynette. And it was just, I've always sort of done that stuff. Yeah. I don't know why it's happened that way. But I didn't realise I was playing with these icons. It was yeah. just, a, you just know, a gig, yeah. this, this was the next gig. Oh, yeah. Chuck Berry, oh, okay, yeah, all right. Yeah. Um, but what a man. I mean, he was, he was, it still is, he, he's still working, a unique character. I'll give you an example. I think it was Marseille, south of France, big, yeah. big arena. And he used to get people up on stage at the end of the show doing rock and roll, yeah. you know, they, you know, come up. So we'd get, and it was packed. And we're going round and round, sweet little 16 or something, you know, and they're, and they're loving it, and they're great. And these people are getting close, and I can't actually, so I'm going, oh, oh come on, mate, get us a bit of oh, garlic, yeah. you know, get off, get <laughs> off. Oh, Jesus. And he went, da -da -da. thank you very much. Off yeah. we go. God, yeah, that was a look. Somebody had nicked my watch. Really? Somebody had nicked my watch. While you were playing? While I was playing in front of God knows how many thousand people. Because <laughs> <laughs> I was going, oh, God. I'll have they that managed away, to mate. take it. <laughs> <laughs> Another Chuck Berry story. We were playing an Enorma Dome in, in Lyon. Yeah. Uh, and uh, the night before, the promoter had thrown out, because he didn't realise who he was, the European head of Chuck Berry's fan club. He threw him out from backstage. Who are you doing it? He was a rather gobby right. tour manager. And so the next night, we're standing there, uh, and Chuck, who now has a grudge against the, promote, uh, the tour manager, and we're standing there, and I'm standing there, all 18 years of me standing there like this, and it's all the day, oh, ladies and gentlemen, shock belly! <laughs> And Chuck just stood there with his guitar like this. Might as well shock Barry. I'm not going on until I've had my money in American dollars. 
And he always got paid. He yeah. got half his money before he left America and the other half in his pocket before he walked out on stage. Yeah. And he'd been paid in francs. Ah. And he wasn't going to go on till it was dollars because that's what his contract said. So he stood there yeah. like that and this promote and I'm... Shabay! So it's a slow hand <laughs> clap. I ain't going on. This promoter, this tour manager had to get in a car, drive into town, knock up a bank manager, get the money changed into dollars, yeah. drive back, give him the money in dollars, and it, all this took about three quarters of an hour, and yeah. the audience was just fucking... Yeah. Oh, they were... Just, uh, they were growling. It was like the police were called, and, it, and he just stood there like this. With his guitar. When he went on, how did that go? Rawr. Oh, oh yeah. so it had the... But, you know, he had a funny way of starting a show yeah. as well, which was, he used to go on and do... Because he really wanted to be a crooner. Mm. So he'd go on, lay it down, check me. And he'd come, and then he would stop and he'd go, rambling rose. <laughs> so he'd do this rambling rose, and then he'd do one verse, and then another verse, and then another verse. <laughs> and then he'd go, and then he'd go, da 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 and he started this rambling rolls. Right. And he did this. And it had gone on for a, just a bit too long. And the audience was sort of bikers and, yeah. and, and ladies with really blonde hair with a black stripe down there, you know, yeah. all that sort of stuff. And this big biker came down the front and he said, Play rock and roll, you black cat. <laughs> with that, he just took the guitar off and walked off and got in his car and left. <laughs> and the what audience did you just, do? You just, you just oh, had to fill in? No, we just, we, you know, the, the audience stormed the stage. We were all taken off, you know. Really? Yeah, put in taken off for your own safety? Yeah, it was all, it's got really nice. Where was that? Yeah. That was in South, it was Walthamstow. Or, Gracious me. Yeah, I know. <laughs> Have you had a best moment, do you think? Well, yes, I, I suppose there is. There, there is a, a, that will never, ever happen again. Uh, I was privileged to be the drummer at the Millennium Dome for the Millennium. Oh. And that was, uh, in, in musical terms, they call it a roast. That yeah. was a real bugger of a gig. Yeah. I mean, it was just, it was just unbelievable. The rehearsal time was completely minimal. Uh, and, and there was all sorts of acts coming on, from opera singers to jazz singers to, it was just, mm. and I was playing drums from the moor. And, and, uh, and behind me was a hundred piece choir, and over there was a hundred piece orchestra. That's a hell of a responsibility. Just, and it was, and I was the only drummer, and it was just like, wow. oh, this way, yeah. you know, Gosh. it's like leading the charge. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> oh, come on, come on. So and to get through that, and with all the, you know, the, the, the problems, because I don't really know to music. I'm dyslexic, yeah. so right. I, you know, I. So it's all feel. Yeah, it's all fear and I'll remember and I, I sort of, you know, follow my instincts really. And um, that night, just, we, we just finished the, the sort of run through with, with MDs and occasional artists would be there, but it was all very, very chaotic. Yeah. I was just packing up, going back to the hotel, thinking, oh God, oh my, I'm just knackered, I can't, tomorrow's going to be a nightmare. And they came up to me and the, and the orchestra leader, Sir somebody or other, came up to me with this piece of music in seven, eight, right. all written out. And he said, I'd like you to play that with the orchestra tomorrow as we haven't got another drummer. Thank you very much. Oh. And it was for the acrobats. Now, I don't know if you've oh. ever played drums for acrobats. No, I can't But it was just am. like, oh, well, yeah, have you got any of this on tape or something? I can listen to it. He said, oh yes, we have a CD. So he gave me this CD. So I spent the night before trying to learn this yeah. Incredibly complex bit of music. On top of everything else you on had. On top of all had. this. So I didn't get any sleep really. And then the next day we do the show. And it was just, oh, fucking hell. Ladies and gentlemen, the Queen. <laughs> da, 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 da. We're being broadcast live around the world to an audience of 17 billion trillion. <laughs> oh, great. Thank you very much. You know. And you're the only And drama. then at 12 o'clock, this is absolutely true, at 12 o'clock, near 12 o'clock, the orchestra goes, the bloke, and I'm here, the podium's there with the conductor on it. He said, um, I said, hey, Gilson, I haven't got my watch on. You wouldn't have the time on you, would you? Uh, 
Oh, and I'm looking at my sort of 10 quid Nokia, you know. Yeah. Oh, I can't really see it. And I'm thinking, well, yeah, I think we're getting up at 12. Uh, not long now. He goes, OK, ready, 12 o'clock, one, two. <laughs> Fucking hell. So you announced started, And I actually, and we started, uh, the new millennium was started by my Nokia, 15 quid Nokia really? watch. <laughs> and I actually think we're about sort of 30 seconds in front of where we should yeah. be. So, yeah, just crazy. So, so when that was finished, uh, up past two in the morning, that was... Yeah. Oh, Thank you very much. Can I not do that again for another <laughs> thousand years? Thank you. That's a good thing to be able to say, though. The, millennium was, the new millennium was started by your 10 quid Nokia. <laughs> the bloke couldn't see his watch. And, of course, the BBC <laughs> hadn't put a clock on stage. No, they'd, <laughs> they'd forgotten to do that, of course. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, I'm sure there was uh, stuff going through headphones. But old Chappie wasn't wearing a yeah. headphone. That was a problem. because he's, so he yeah, he's doing know, all the button he's, he's doing stuff. all this stuff. Yeah. <laughs> Thanks, Gilson. We're going to stop it there briefly because uh, that concludes the first part of this interview. Please make sure to tune in next week for the second part of Gilson Lavis on Mad, Bad and Dangerous. Hello. I hope you enjoyed that first part of our interview with the legend Gilson Lavis. The second part will be up soon. In the meantime... For all our videos, please click on the links, like, and if you've a mind, give them a share. Cheers.